So this is uh, loose ass. Now, there's, there's a number of different ways you can interact with it. But to start with, I'm going to bring in a CAD drawing. So I'm just going to go to File, uh, Import, and I'm just going to import a DXF file. Uh, I've got one here. So I'm going to bring in this uh, simple trust bridge. So it's been drawn up in CAD. It's been sent out as DXF, and I can then import the, the geometry. And you can see that, that there. We can work with more complicated models as well, so I'm just going to delete that. And this time I'm going to import an IGIS file, a slightly more advanced CAD format. And this is going to bring in sort of complex geometry that I would use for a localized analysis for connecting a, a cable to a, perhaps a, a pylon in a small cable stayed footbridge. So you can see that on the screen there. That's coming from CAD. Now, in LUSAS, uh, points are red. Lines are pink, surfaces are green, volumes are blue. Now, because this is green, I know it's like a hollow tin box at the moment. So all I'm going to do is select everything, hit the volume button. That will turn it into a blue volume. And I can then use the automatic mesher on it. Now, I'm just going to use a, a basic irregular mesh on this. So this is where LUSAS differs from some of the programs out there. We work with geometry. And we then have very powerful meshing algorithms that will then work out how to apply the mesh to that. Now, you can control it, but here I'm letting the program work it out for me. Now, I'm just going to put a colored render onto this. OK, so as I spin this around, you can see it's meshed. But can you see here that the mesh isn't following the circular geometry? And this is because the mesh that I put on here at the moment is what we call a linear mesh. It's our low order mesh. But if I go up to the quadratic mesh, this is the truly curved mesh. So in LUSAS, you always have a choice between a linear or quadratic element. And the quadratic are the, the, the curved elements. So we don't have to just work with straight beam elements. We have a quadratic beam element that will allow me to model curved structures. OK, so this is now updated the mesh on the screen if I rotate it around. So what I would have to do to that now is apply some supports, a material, some loading, and I can then start looking at the stresses on the outside, or I could slice it up and look at what's happening to the stresses in, on the inside. So we've got a very powerful geometry engine, but I'm going to go back now and look at a, a much simpler example. This is an example from our examples manual. We have a number of detailed worked examples. Now, in the examples manual, this is actually in uh, kilonewton meters, this example. But I'm actually converting it, and I've done a, a model in uh, kitchen feet. Now, again, just to save a bit of time, I've already created the lines. So here, we've just got a series of lines that are going to be used to represent this geometry on the screen here. So it's a very simple line model that we're working with. Now, in the tree view here, the attributes tree view is a list of the engineering properties. Now, I've already got a few in here. So if I take these two lines where the columns are and drag this rectangular section on, you'll see that they then appear on the screen. If I select this part of the model, this part of the model, if I drag on the peer solid, that's the sort of diaphragm section for the box that I'm going to connect in. And I've also got a diaphragm section at each end that I'm going to use, which is there. Now, all of these sections have been calculated using the internal section calculators inside LUSAS. So there's the one for the rectangular columns that I'm using. I've also used the box calculator here to calculate these diaphragm sections and also some hollow boxes. Now, to save time, I've already stored those in the section library. Now, the section library contains the commercial sections that you can go and buy. It also contains the ones that you create, so the user library. And here you can see I've got this box section. OK, so if I were to pick this line here, I can drop that on. And you can see my box section is now flashed or visible in the model. I'm just going to right hand mouse button, keep only as visible. And if I spin this round, you can see that I've got my linear box section. Now, as well as just linear box sections, we can do tapered box sections. Now, I'm just going to do a very simple linear taper where I choose different size boxes to taper between. So I'm going to taper between a small box and a big box. 
over here I'm keeping the alignments so the top of the sections are flat. Okay, so if I now pick uh, this line and drag that on, so you're now looking at the linear tapered box. Now in this case we're just uh, tapering the overall height of the box, but it could be that I want to taper locally the thickness of the bottom flange or the walls. All of this is possible. Now in LUSAS, we do a very accurate calculation of the taper. In some of the more simple programs out there, what they will do is they will take the numerical values of the section here, add them to the numerical values of the section here, and they give you an average value in the middle. Now for area, that might not be too bad, but for second moments of area, it will be quite out, so I'll be wrong. What we do is we actually taper the shape and at any intermediate nodes along the line that we've got, we recalculate the section properties based on the shape of the section, not on the engineering property. So very accurate representation of the taper. Now, I can also do what I call a multivariating section. And this is where you can choose any number of geometric stations. So I'm just going to apply one. I'm going to hit the um, tab button. Now the distance here, this line, this section of the bridge, is about 130 feet long. So I'm going to put that in, and I'm going to put one in there at 90. Now at the moment, I've got sections 1, 2, and 3 having exactly the same shape. But here I can choose to have a different shape. So I'm going to go for the here box there. Now what we've got here at the moment is a smoothing exercise. So here it says it's smooth. And I could choose to linearize this. So you can see we've got a linear portion between sections 1 and 2, and then a linear taper between sections 2 and 3. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to change this second one to be an intermediate box. Now, we can also do sort of uh, parametrics or, or quadratics through these as well. So it doesn't have to be just this smooth. But lots of different ways of coming up with the shape. And you can see we've now got a, a smooth curve through there. I'm going to hit the Apply button. I'm going to delete this name. And I'm going to hit the Flip button here. Because we're doing a balanced cantilever structure, I want the opposite section as well. OK, so if I now go back to All Visible, I'm going to pick this line and this line, drop on the first section that I created. Pick this line and this line, drop on the second section that I've created. So here, although it looks like it's quite complex geometry we're working with, it's actually just the five section properties here that are colored in that are allowing me to model this whole structure. OK, let me finish this off. Materials now, material library. I'm going to go for a concrete USA, and I'm going to go for, say, a 5 KSI. Now, anything that comes out of the library, if you double click on it, you go back to the library. If you want to change it, right-hand mouse button, edit attributes, and you can then edit the library numbers. Obviously, this won't edit the library. It will create a, a new material, effectively, with the edited numbers. Or if you just wanted to type in numbers yourself, we have a blank dialog that you can type in your own material property. So very flexible. But I'm going to use just the, the basic library properties in this case. OK, support. I'm going to keep it really simple. I'm going to have uh, fixed translationally and rotationally for the bottom of the this. So I'm just going to call this fixed. And at the end of the deck here, I'm going to have a roll of support. So it's free to move in the X direction, and it's also going to be free to rotate. OK, now I'm just going to switch the fleshing off. This button here takes me back to a line diagram. So I can just take those, put on the fixed supports. I'm going to pick the point at the end there and a point at the end here and put on the roller sports. OK, I missed that one, so I'm just going to zoom in here. There is a point there, but it's hiding under the axis system. OK, so there's my roller supports. OK, so I've set up some very basic support conditions. I've got my engineering properties in there. Low case number one, the blue arrow there represents that I've got gravity load on it by default. I'm just going to rename this to dead load. So I'm ready to test whether the model runs. So I'm just going to hit the Save button and Solve. Now the model runs, and you can see on the screen there, we've got the 
exaggerated deformed shape being visualized. Now, before I go on and talk about results processing, I just want to show you what happens when you make a mistake. Now, I'm going to deliberately take this line and I'm going to remove the material properties from it. So be assigned from selection. So this is as if I've made a mistake in the building of the model. Now, with all programs, there's a learning curve. It's how quickly you can overcome that learning curve. So I know the model is broken, so if I try to solve it, I will get an error message on the screen. One or more lines have occurred, please refer to text window. It's telling me to look down here, and down here, I will have an error message telling me that line 30 has no material properties. Now, what I could do is I could switch on my labels layer and label each of the lines with its line number, and I could then scan through the model to find it. But it's far easier. In LUSAS, all I need to do is double click on the error. I get this identify object dialog, and I personally use the top two options and the bottom option. So when I hit apply, it selects the line, and you should see a box zoom in to show you where the problem is. So very easy to identify where the problem is, no materials. So I drag back on my materials, and the model will now run. So all you have to do to debug a model in LUSAS is basically double click on the text window error message, and it will show you where the problem is in the model. If you read the error message, it tells you what the error is. I'm just going to go straight on to talk about the, the results processing on this, effectively. Now I'm going to switch off my uh, fleshing. I'm going to go to my layers. I'm going to switch off my deform mesh, bring back the mesh. And I'm going to look at my diagram layer. So if I switch this on, obviously what we're looking at here is a bending moment diagram on the whole structure. Now obviously I could look at shear force diagrams, actual force diagrams. So that's one way of looking at the results. I'm going to switch that off switch the flashing back on because I'm going to look at contours of stress now. Now because we know the shape of the objects, I can take my beam axial and bending moments and turn them into stresses on the model itself. Now in here, the red area I know is going to crack due to tensile stresses in terms of I would need to use post tension on this. So it's a very good way of looking at, say, top fiber, bottom fiber stresses on concrete models, so you can understand what the sort of stress limits are approaching to. Now, in reality, this big box structure like this would be post-tensioned. As Terry's already said, we've got a full range of post-tensioning tools, and some of the examples cover those. I'm just not going to have time to go through all the post-tensioning on this model. The other ways we can get results out, if I go to utilities, I can go to a print result wizard. Now, this is essentially taking my graphical results and giving to them to me in a spreadsheet type output. So if I hit finish here, now here you can see the nodes. I've got the FX, FY, FZ, MX, MY, MZ. Now, if I had multiple load cases in my model, I would have a separate worksheet for each load case. In here, if I want to find out what the biggest numbers are, I can just right hand mouse button, sort ascending, and it will show me the biggest negative at the top, and if the bottom will be the biggest positive. Now, it's not quite a spreadsheet, but it acts very similar to a spreadsheet. But if you want to take this out into a spreadsheet, all I need to do is save as Excel. So I don't even need to cut and paste the numbers out there. They will be saved straight to the Excel spreadsheet for further results processing if you want. So we have very good graphical interfaces in the software, very good tabular. We also have a full reporting system inside the, the model. Now in here, if I right hand bounce button new reports, I'm just going to call this bridge. Uh, the units could be changed, so if you wanted to do a model in kips and feet but you needed to send it to say Canada in kilonewton meters, you could do that easily. I'm going to leave it the same. Now, this is a blank cover to a book. If I right-hand mouse button, I'm going to add chapters. Now, I personally are going to put in all the geometry properties to start with. So these are all the engineering properties that I put in to create this model. Now, if I want to view the report, I can say view report. Now, 
it loads up a reporting package in the background. It takes a few seconds because it is a, a rather large program that's loading up. But it'll appear on the screen and I can then look at my reports. So here, table of contents, those are my point coordinates, my line connectivities, and here are my geometric sections with a, a summary of what they are, and down here are the values that I'm using. And if I just scroll through this, you'll see that all the geometry in there is the material supports, and it's telling me that I've got gravity switched on in my low case one. Now, you can get all the tabular results out in this, which I'm going to add in a minute. So I'm just going to close the report down. So I'm going to add other things to this. So I'm going to add chapter. I'm going to look at basic result cases. So I'm just going to look at force moment. And in here, rather than look at all the components, I'm just going to look at FY and MY. So these two components are the shear and the bending moment that I want. And I'm just going to say, OK, results. So this will have added in a table of numbers, very similar to the print results wizard I just showed you. But we can also add in graphs and images as well. If I go to Window, and I'm going to save a view, this will basically capture the image on the screen, so I can use that in my report. So if I go back to my report now, and view report, uh, no, I want to add chapter. So I want to add that save view. Now I can view the report. Now what this will have done is it will have added in the table of numbers. It will also add it in, if I scroll to the end, the image here basically. If I go back, you'll see the table of numbers is there. Now the key thing here, this report is dynamic. So if I change my model, I'm going to take these two bottoms of my peers here and I'm going to move them in the Z direction by say, let's guess, say 20 feet. Okay, now the reason the results have disappeared from here is because obviously I need to resolve. As soon as I resolve, those results will reappear. Now if I go back into my report now and just view the reports, everything will have updated. I don't need to recapture the images or any graphs. Everything will be based on the new model. And you can clearly see this is now showing me the short legs. So this is a great efficiency tool because I can build reports and if someone then finds a problem with my model, I just need to put that problem right. All I need to then do is reprint the report. And this report can go out into PDF, HTML, Word, Excel, whatever format you want. Usually it's the PDF format that you'll be sending out. But it basically means if you do need to make changes to the model, if you've got the report already set up, you just print it out again. You can also use the report as a template for a next job. So if you're doing something like a box culvert and you've then got another box culvert to look at, you can export the report from one model and import it as the starting point in the second model. So again, great efficiency there.